Okay, 2 Timothy chapter 2. Let us read verse 15 to begin our message this morning. I want to preach a message titled Hyper Dispensationalism. I've not only drawn this out on the board, but I also gave you a handout in color, which is a picture of what's on the board. And uh, this is not my chart that I follow today, but it is a chart that is followed by those who we would refer to as hyper-dispensationalists, which I used to be one. And so I've drew many charts over the years, and there's hundreds of charts, and this is just uh, one of the charts that I have drawn in the past. But notice with me as we come here, and one of the reasons I want to preach on this today, and I thought I could do it in one sermon, and I can't, I'm going to preach tonight a message titled The Postponed a kingdom theory, and then we may come back Wednesday night and say some other things about it. But I was asked to preach on this by someone in the church also in February, coming back from a funeral. I told my wife, uh, I said that, I, she said, you need to address this uh, sometimes. I said, oh, I'm going to be doing it by summer. Well, we're in summer, and so I'm going to address it this morning. I'm only going to deal with three issues this morning, and that is the gospel and water baptism in the church. There's many other issues that go into this uh, this type of teaching. And also, and just like this little chart I have here in my hand, uh, seven dispensations. I'm sure you've heard of that. Seven different ones, but we're not going to get into that this morning. But notice with me, as we come and read our text, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, and by the way, I have an entire sermon on this verse preached in 2012. Well, he says here in verse 15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Notice that expression, rightly dividing the word of truth. Heavenly Father, we ask, Lord, this morning that Thy blessings would be upon the reading of Holy Scripture. Father, we pray this morning that You would speak to our hearts. Uh, we pray, God, that as we look at this subject, we pray that Thy will to be done. And Lord, help us this morning, for it's in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Back earlier in the year, while I was out of town, I had someone... Uh, later, a week or so later, sent me a DVD, and it was titled, Grace Age Praying. In other words, don't pray any prayer unless it's in Paul's epistles. I listened to the sermon, and it's about one of the most ridiculous things that I have seen in a while. But anyway, uh, we're going to look at that this morning. Now, I want to give you an introduction, and uh, we're going to look at a few other verses in this chapter. I'm going to back up to verse 14 and read through 18 in just a moment. But as we come to this subject, hyper-dispensationalism, and let me just say this in the very beginning, there's a, a variety of beliefs even among them. And what we mean by this is those who carry dispensationalism to extremes. We know that uh, there's many extre extremes today. Similar extremes would be hyper-Calvinism or uh, the Baptist brighters. But we all make distinctions, do we not? We make distinctions between the Old Covenant and the New. We make distinctions between Christ's sacrifice and animal sacrifices, between the moral law and the ceremonial law, between ancient Israel of the Old Testament and the church uh, that is mentioned in the New Testament. So we all make certain distinctions but what we're talking about this morning is extreme divisions in the Word of God. Now, <clears throat> I was introduced to this uh, at 19 years of age, only a few months after that I was converted. That was in 1972. I was only saved probably two or three months when I was introduced to this type of teaching. So I was new. I didn't know the Bible. I'd never owned a Bible before I'd gotten saved. And so I was sitting one night, and uh, uh, at, this is uh, aboard the USS Lexington in 1972, a few months after I was saved. 
And I was sitting one night and I was reading my Bible that I had bought uh, just before that. And I was reading Matthew 24, verse 13, and Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9. And I just was looking at these and they just did not seem to reconcile together. And the lieutenant walked through the doors. About midnight, he was doing his rounds. And uh, he walked through the door and said, What you doing, sailor? I said, I'm reading my Bible and I don't understand it. And he said, Maybe I can help you. We became friends and spent a lot of time with him over the years. Matter of fact, I just spoke with him a month ago on the phone. And uh, I started going to his church. It was a grace church. Uh, what I'm referring to this morning is the grace movement, as they would call it. They call themselves grace believers, grace brethren, or Bereans. And so anyway, I started going to his church. And I later, uh, years later, had pastored two grace churches myself. I spoke in conferences every month in different states. I had television ministry, three radio ministries at the time. I also became president of a camp that was basically uh, centered around the grace movement and the grace teaching, uh, a Bible camp. I, I was a president of that for five years. And so I was involved with them for a number of years. And 27 years ago, I got out of the association. Association, probably about 25 preachers. And I publicly, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, in a meeting, uh, that conference that we were holding, I publicly preached a message uh, contrary to some of the beliefs that were there, and I stepped out of it. But I've never addressed this subject in 27 years. I left it alone. Now, I may throw out a little something in a sermon or whatever, like uh, when I preached on rightly dividing the Word, but I've never preached a message on this subject. When I got letters from people in our association, I filed them in a garbage can. I never responded to anybody. That's been 27 years now. I left it alone. I left all of them alone. I just uh, I just stayed by myself. And one of the best things, and I told Brian this a few months ago, one of the best things that ever happened to me is to be alone and not be running with a pack of preachers. I'm able to sit down and read the Bible and not be influenced by some system of theology. And it, that's one of the best things that's ever happened to me. Now, in our introduction, I'm going to come back here to these verses. And I got some quotes. I probably won't use any of them. Again, you have your chart. I got a few things. I read some quotes. I probably will skip them, but I got several papers laying here this morning, if I choose and have the time to quote some of the people that are in this movement. But basically, the grace movement, as it is referred to by many, they believe that they have arrived at certain truths that no one else has, no other church, no other denomination. Uh, This leads to intellectual pride by many. Many are sincere, very sincere, but they're sincerely wrong. And there's a large variation of beliefs even among the uh, dispensationalists, just like they are with Baptists or any other group of people. Now, you'll notice with me that as we come back here to our text in verse 15, you'll notice with me, I'm going to read it again, that Timothy is a minister commanded by God through the Apostle Paul to rightly divide the word of truth. Notice what he says in verse 15 again. He says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, when we talk about rightly dividing the word of truth, what they mean is chopping the Bible up as I have in this chart here. For instance, I've got on this chart up here the Old Testament, Genesis through Malachi. Then I've got here Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I've got underneath that what they would refer to as the gospel of the kingdom. The reason I know all of this because I used to preach some of these same things. And then you would come into the book of Acts after that Christ had died on the cross. And between Acts 1 and 9, the kingdom was supposed to have been re-offered to Israel They rejected it. They fell. 
And then God saved Paul and gave him a new message, a new gospel, and started something brand new. So Romans through Philemon is considered as the church age, the mystery that no one else knew but Paul, and it is called the gospel of the grace of God or the gospel of Christ. Then you come over to Hebrews through Revelation, and they say that once the church is taken out of this world, they say that uh, once the church is removed, that in Hebrews through Revelation, the kingdom is offered again during the tribulation time and for seven-year tribulation, and then the kingdom is established, the 1,000-year millennial. After that, the gospel of the kingdom is picked up again and restored. Now, notice with me as we come to this text, and I want you to understand that if you can rightly divide the word of truth, then you can wrongly divide the word of truth. So, this is one of their key verses to base their system of theology on. Rightly dividing the word of truth. If you were in a meeting with some of them, you would hear this expression many times over the course of one meeting. No matter what they preach on, they're usually talking about this particular verse. Well, notice with me that as we look around in this chapter, we find that uh, the context is contrasting true doctrine with false doctrine. Notice with me as we read from verse 14. He says, Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not with words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearer. We find a warning that is given here in verse 14 about using words of no profit that subvert the hear. The word subvert means to overturn or ruin. There's a warning in verse 16 about profane babbling and ungodliness. There is a warning in verse 17 about cankerous words that eat away and destroy like a cancer or an infection of the body. And then in verse 17... You'll notice here, well, verse 17, that, that's where the, the, he said, and their words will eat as doeth a canker, of whom is Hymenius and Philetus. There's two false teachers right there. Then in verse 18, there's warning again, uh, uh, uh about, uh, uh, those false teachers that would overthrow the faith. Verse 18, talking about these two men in verse 17, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. And so as we consider this and as we look at it, we see that when he says in chapter 2, verse 15, that we are to study, to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, when he says rightly dividing the word of truth, he is not talking about chopping up the Bible and throwing certain uh, parts of it away. What is he saying here? Well, he's saying to teach it correctly, to divide truth from error, uh, to give accurate interpretation of the Scripture. It means to handle the Word of God correctly and properly. As a matter of fact, the Greek word is O-R-T-H-O-T-O-M-O-S for the two words rightly dividing in English. And it means to cut straight. Uh, it has the ideal of uh, uh, holding a straight line to cut a right or to guide on a straight path. In other words, it's like a farmer plowing a straight furrow. It's like a carpenter cutting a straight uh, board, a mason cutting a straight stone. It's like a surgeon cutting correctly and carefully and skillfully that there would bring healing uh, to the body. And so this is what rightly dividing means. It does not mean that you divide Jesus' teaching from Paul's or Paul's teachings from Peter or you divide the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John from Romans through Philemon, or Hebrews through the book of Revelation. And so rightly dividing the word is not chopping up 
the Bible and saying there's two churches and two gospels and two comings and two hopes and things of that nature. Now, I want you to turn with me to Galatians chapter 1 and notice with me in Galatians chapter 1. Now, I'm going to begin reading in verse 6 in Galatians chapter 1. Now, right here are some of the forefathers of hyper-dispensationalism. Their teachings had basically had its origin in the 1800s and became very popular in the 1900s. Here are a list of, of some of the people. Uh, John Darby in the 1800s, he found, was the founder of the Brethren Movement. E.W. Bollinger, uh, he was the one that put together the Companion Bible. And you don't need the notes in that, by the way. I have one on my shelf. Uh, he went to extreme uh, divisions of the Bible. He even divided Paul's epistles from the Acts epistles to the prison epistles and didn't start the church until Acts chapter 28. hyper will either start the church in Acts 9, not at Pentecost, Acts 9, Acts 13, or Acts chapter 28. And I know all of this would sound foolish to some of you, but you understand how that people, how that we all can get off base because, for instance, as I just, my question was to this lieutenant, how do I reconcile in Matthew, he that endureth to the end shall be saved with Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, uh, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. How do we reconcile Romans 4 with James chapter 2, when Romans 4 clearly says that Abraham was justified by faith without works, and James chapter 2 says that Abraham was justified by faith and works? I mean, how do you reconcile those things? This is the reason that many have come to the conclusion, as I was taught in my very beginning of my Christianity, uh, they've come to these conclusions because I just can't reconcile things. So some of the forefathers goes all the way back to the 1800 and brings you into the 1900s. For instance, E.W. Bullinger, that produced the Companion Bible. He died in 1913. Charles Welch in England. I have had a couple of his books. Uh, the Schofield Reference Bible, who has not had one of them, uh, that was published in 1909, uh, he, he didn't go to ex- that the quite extremes that some did, but he still was extreme. And uh, his reference Bible was uh, popularized the teaching of dispensationalism. And that Bible got into just about every college and seminary around our country, and so it influenced many in several different denominations. How many have one of those, by the way? Anybody have one? Most people that I know at least has one, you know, somewhere, and a lot of people carry them. Well, also you had Cornelius Stamm up north in Chicago, Illinois. He's dead now. I, I knew him, spoken with him on the phone, Berean Bible Society, and um, somebody else took his place after he died. In the south, uh, E.C. Moore, I knew him personally. He's been in my home, we've uh, spent a lot of time together. Uh, J.C. O'Hare, uh, Charles F. Baker, who uh, wrote the book Dispensational Theology. I've had it for years. Uh, Donald Gray Barnhouse, Les Feldick. Uh, he's pretty popular today on the radio and television and on the Internet and YouTube. And then uh, Otis Sellers, and there's many others, Ricky Jordan, that's from Mobile, that's been in Illinois for many, many years. And then even Baptist, there's Baptist, Peter S. Ruckman, he died a year or two ago. But he actually said that you would go to hell believing Acts chapter 2, verse 38, where Peter mentions faith and baptism. And he said you'd go to hell believing James chapter 2 as well. In other words, he was a Baptist, uh, but he narrowed this thing down to the Pauline epistles when it comes to the gospel of Christ. So, so that's some of the forefathers. What are the core beliefs of uh, hyperdispensationalism? We're going to, I'm going to go as far as I can this morning and stop and we'll pick back up later. But here's the core belief is that Paul 
alone was given revelation for the church today and only his writings apply to the church today. In other words, the teaching of Jesus and Peter applies to Israel and the kingdom gospel, as they would say. Uh, they also believe that water baptism is not for this age. They believe that the church in Paul's epistles is different than the church that's mentioned in Matthew 16, verse 18, where Jesus said upon this rock, I will build my church. They believe that was a kingdom church, the Jew, and Paul preached uh, uh, about the church, which is the body of Christ. They believe in a postponed kingdom. In other words, the kingdom was postponed after that Christ died on the cross and God started something new. We're going to deal with that tonight. Uh, they, uh, they believe that we're not under the great commission of Matthew chapter 28. They believe in, in constantly weighing kingdom against grace. Many of them believe that repentance is not for the dispensation of grace. There's even some that throw away the Lord's Supper and the new birth. They believe that there's two comings of Christ. And also, again, they make major distinctions between Israel and the church, the body and the bride, and things like that. In other words, they claim that the teachings of Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are not binding on the church today, like the Sermon on the Mount, the Upper Room uh, Discourse, the Lord's Prayer, and all the parables that have to do with the kingdom. Now, by the way, how many would say amen that they are some difficult passages in some of those but do we throw them away? Or do we find a way to reconcile them with the rest of the Scripture? And so basically, the four Gospels are entirely Jewish in their mind. Totally Jewish. And what this is, this is a cop-out. Instead of searching and trying to find the, uh, the treasures of God, it's a cop-out and it leads to shallowness and looseness in their lives. Now, notice in Galatians chapter 1, and uh, I'm going to have to time myself with each point. I have three points. First, the gospel. Is there more than one gospel? Secondly, water baptism. Should baptism be practiced today? And then the church. Is there a kingdom church? in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Hebrews through Revelation, and a Grace Church, or the body of Christ in Paul's epistles. Let's first of all consider the issue of the gospel. And I, in other words, they teach that the gospel that Peter preached, that Jesus preached, and Peter and the twelve preached, and the early part of the book of Acts, uh, they teach that that is different than the gospel that Paul preached. Okay? Now, Notice as I began reading in verse 6, and I want you to think about something. If you were to put a chart and just take a piece of paper and put a chart of the book of Acts, the book of Acts will cover between 30 and 40 years. Okay? Between 30 and 40 years. And if you were to lay that out through the book of Acts, you're going to find it at least 30 years. At least 30 years. Because um, Jesus died, we'll say, A.D. 33. And by the time you get to Acts 28, that's about A.D. 64. Paul is there preaching. And you've got about a good 30 years plus. Think about this. Peter and Paul are both preaching throughout that time. You don't find their death mentioned in the book of Acts. So they're preaching throughout this time. And they're intercross, intermingling and crossing paths and preaching sometimes to the same people. And you're going to tell me that Peter and Paul preached in the first century and crossing paths, even preaching to the same people, and they're preaching two different gospels? And, and those that got saved by Peter was in one church, the kingdom church, and those that got saved through Paul was in the grace church? Now I want you to just think about how Ludicrous that that is, that two men that praise each other and talk about each other that are preaching two different Gospels, by, one by faith and works and the other one by faith without works, that don't even make any sense. Especially over a 30 plus period of time. Now notice as we read in verse 6 through 9, I marvel that you're so soon removed 
from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, Paul himself, or an angel, from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be what? Accursed. Now think about this. In verse 9, and we, and we said, as we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Well, listen, if Peter was preaching a different gospel at this time, then Peter placed himself under a curse. Because the Apostle Paul said, if even himself or any man or an angelic being from heaven preach any other gospel, and we know what that gospel is, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. He said, if any man preach any other gospel, let him be accursed. So if Peter, James and John, and the other apostles was preaching another gospel that was faith and works, and the, call the kingdom gospel as they would call it, then Peter and the apostles all would be under this curse. In other words, Peter and Paul are preaching at the same time throughout the period of the book of Acts, preaching to the same people sometimes and the same gospel they were preaching. Now notice as we come down to verse 22 and 23. By the way, he mentions the church of God. I'm going to come back later to in verse 13. But he said in verse 22 and 23, Paul is saying here that he he's given his testimony of how that he got saved and how God called him to preach. But I'm skipping some verses for time's sake. And he says in verse 22, "...and was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea which were in Christ." And I'm going to come back to that statement later on the message. And then he said in verse 23, watch this, "...but they had heard only that he which persecuted us in time past now preaches the faith which once he destroyed." Notice that Paul is preaching the faith that he wants destroyed. Well, I know the faith that he wants destroyed. It was the gospel that Jesus gave unto his disciples. It was the gospel that Peter was preaching. This is the gospel of the faith that he wants destroyed. But it says in verse 23, And they had heard only that he which persecuted us in time past now, now watch this, now preaches the faith, that is the gospel or the doctrine, which once he destroyed. So when Paul, before Paul was converted, in Acts 7 and Acts chapter 8, he's fighting against the Lord and against the disciples. He had Stephen put to death and so forth. And he's persecuting the church because of the gospel that Peter, James, and John and others were preaching. And then Paul is converted in Acts chapter 9. And you know what he started preaching? He started preaching exactly what Peter, James, and John was preaching. And that is the death burial, and resurrection. In Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, the first sermon after Christ ascended up, Peter preached it, and it was the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter goes back to the Old Testament to prove that Christ is the Messiah, that He did die for sins, and He was buried, and that He rose again the third day. And Ephesians 4, 5 said, there is only one faith. There's not two or three different faiths. There's one faith. There's one gospel. There's one doctrine that Peter, James, and John preached. And the Apostle Paul, after he was saved, he began preaching the same thing. Well, notice in Galatians chapter 2, and again I'm skipping around, maybe that we can come back and touch on this again. Galatians chapter 2, the event that Paul is writing about took place in Acts chapter 15. And we're going to turn in a little bit to Acts chapter 15. But I'm skipping down a little bit. I'm going to begin reading in verse 7. He said, But contrarywise, when they saw... Now again, you can read about this whole event in Acts 15. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the, the uncircumcision was committed unto me, 
as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave unto me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. Now, Paul's main ministry centered around the Gentiles. But Paul went to the Jews. Every city he went in, the first thing he did is go in the synagogue and preach to the Jews. Jews would get saved, they would start a church, and then the Gentiles would come in. Peter's main ministry was centered around the Jews. But Peter also preached to the Gentiles. The Corinthians knew about him, and others knew about him. Now, the gospel of the circumcision and the gospel of the uncircumcision are not two different gospels. What it is, it's the same gospel, but it's to two different people. And notice now, now Peter, you remember Peter in Acts 10 was the first apostle to go to the Gentiles. He was the very first one. And in Acts 10, God had to give a vision to Peter, let down with a sheet, and give a vision before he would even go to Cornelius. So the Jews would not even sit down and eat with the Gentiles. It is Paul who really brings all this to full light from the Old Testament Scriptures that the Jew and Gentile both will be saved. And But in the beginning of the Great Commission, the, the, the apostles were only going to the Jews. And Peter was forced to go to Cornelius. Well, Peter's getting a hold of this. And now we find Paul having to rebuke Peter in verses 11 through verse 16 because Peter is enjoying fellowshipping with the Gentiles now. He's with Paul, they're fellowshipping with the Gentiles. But when he heard that James and some of the other apostles was coming, you know what he did? He got up and removed himself from the table of the Gentiles. And that kind of messed with some people. It messed with James, even Barnabas was kind of upset about this, and Paul had to rebuke him. But notice what Paul said. I'm not concerned about... Uh, who's eating with who at this time. But notice what Paul said unto Peter in verse uh, 15. Watch this. He said, we are, we who are Jews. Talking about Peter. He just rebuked him in verse 11 and 12 and 13. He said, but we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. He's saying this to Peter. He's saying, Peter, you and I both know. He said, don't try to make the Gentiles be like the Jews or the Jews be like the Gentiles. He said, you and I know that no man is justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of of Christ. He's saying, Peter, you and I, he's saying to Peter, don't worry about mingling with the Gentiles. Don't let fear stop you when you see the Jews that will come against you. He's saying, you and I both know that no one is saved by the works of the law. This is proof that Peter was not preaching salvation by faith and good works. Turn with me, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And 1 Corinthians chapter 15, notice here. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I'm reading for verse 1 through 4 to begin with. Now here is the gospel that Paul preached. And I'm going to tell you what it is. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And it's the same gospel that Peter, James, and John preached. In other words, what I'm trying to show you this morning is that the question I asked pertaining to the gospel, is there more than one gospel? Okay? Hyperdispensationists believe that Peter preached the gospel of the kingdom and Paul preached the gospel of the grace of God. Now, in verses 1 through 4, Moreover, brethren, 
I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also you have received and wherein you stand, by which also you're saved, if you keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless you believed in vain. Now here it is. Well, I delivered unto you first of all that which also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scripture, and that He was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scripture. All right, clearly, in our text, we see that the gospel that Paul preached is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, let's read on and notice the witness of the apostles. He said in verse 5, and that he was seen of Cephas. And by the way, Cephas is mentioned in chapter 1, verse 12. We'll read that later on. Cephas is mentioned in chapter 1 and verse 12. The Corinthians well knew him, and some of the Corinthians followed him. Also, Cephas is mentioned again in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 22 and 23. And he's mentioned, the apostles there are mentioned again in chapter 4, verses 1 and verse 9. So, Peter is recognized by Paul as having the gospel of Christ, and the Corinthians also recognized him as preaching the gospel of Christ. Now, notice as we read from verse 5, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, after that it was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this, pre- this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of the apostles, and last of all it was seen of me, also of one born out of due time. Notice in verse 11. Now watch this carefully. This answers the question about what Peter and Paul preached. In verse 11, he says, Therefore, whether it were I or they, the they is Peter and the apostles of verse 5 and 6 and 7. He says in verse 11, Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach and so ye believe. They were all preaching the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. They're all preaching that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures and that He was buried and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Paul is saying it does not matter whether Cephas or the apostles or I preach this to you. It's the same gospel. It's the same message. It's the same Christ, the same death, burial, and resurrection. This verse, as well as Galatians 1, clearly show us that Peter and Paul preached exactly the same gospel. Now, if you ask the question, did Peter have a little more light than John the Baptist? Yes, he did. Did Paul maybe have some light that the apostle didn't have? Well, Paul wrote 14 letters in the New Testament. So, so, but it's not that they preached anything different. One may know a little something, the other doesn't know, but it's not that they preach anything different. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. In 1 Peter, notice with me in chapter 1. Now, I want to just skip around here just for a few moments in, in this uh, uh, book. But notice, and, and for time's sake, I'm just going to point out some things. I may not even read them all. But notice in verse 2 of chapter 1, and and let me just point this out. He speaks of the blood of Jesus Christ and sanctification and grace and peace. He speaks of being begotten again or born again in verse 3, an inheritance preserved in heaven. And in verse 5, he said, "...who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time." Peter spoke of salvation, the blood of Christ, uh, sanctification. Uh, He spoke of election, the new birth, uh, the hope, the resurrection from the dead, the inheritance. He spoke of the fact that we're kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last... Same thing that Peter spoke about. But notice in chapter 1, reading in verse 18 through 20. 
He said, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot, who was verily foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Peter preached the precious blood of Christ for our sins. You'll notice with me as we look in chapter 2 and verse 24. Chapter 2, verse 20, verse 25, he said, And you were sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your soul. Speaks of his crucifixion in verse 23 and 24. You'll notice with me in chapter 3 and verse 18, he said, For Christ also had once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Peter preached that Christ died for our sins, that Christ suffered once for our sins, the just to the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Peter is preaching the same gospel that Paul preached. But notice in 2 Peter chapter 3, in 2 Peter chapter 3, and notice with me as I come to verse 15, 16, and 17. I want you to see here in this passage that Peter said that Paul had written to the same people that he was writing to. In other words, Peter encouraged people to listen to Paul. Notice in verse 15 an account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. Even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to his wisdom hath given unto him, hath written unto who? Writing to the same people Peter's writing to. And he calls him our beloved brother Paul. He was once a persecutor, but now he's a beloved brother. And he goes on to say, as also in all his epistles, speaking in him the things in which some things are hard to be understood, which they, talking about those who hate the Lord, they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do also the other scriptures under their own destruction. But notice he said, ye, ye therefore beloved, seeing you know these things. In other words, he's saying, you know the things I'm preaching to you, and you know the things that Paul preached. He says, seeing that you know these things before, beware lest you also being led away with the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness. Peter is saying that Paul wrote to you and I am writing to you. Peter is saying, I want to encourage you to listen to the things of Paul even though he's got a lot to say, there are others that are perverting his writings and distorting his truth. Clearly, in this passage, Peter and Paul are brothers in Christ in the same church, preaching the same gospel and writing letters to the same people. Turn with me to Acts chapter 15 and notice here. Now, Acts 15 uh, takes up the where we were talking about a moment ago in Galatians 2. But I want to begin reading in verse 6. If you're taking notes this morning, Peter's first sermon on the day of Pentecost. I've already said this, I'm going to say it again. Death, burial, resurrection of Christ, ascension, and lordship. Also, when we come through the Scriptures, Romans 4, write it down and read the first eight verses. He mentions Abraham. And he said that Abraham, Abraham lived before the law and he was saved by faith without works. And he says that David, under the law, was also saved by faith without works. I mean, read that. How many of you read that? How many know that's true? Abraham, before the law, was saved by faith. Righteousness was imputed to him by faith in what God had said. The same was true with David. Did they have laws and regulations? Yes, we have commandments today. But we're not saved by keeping those commandments. And so when we look at this, salvation has always been by faith in what God has said. 
And Paul quotes the Old Testament Scriptures over 200, I'm going to say around, 200 times in his epistles to confirm what he preached. Everything that Paul preached came out of the Old Testament. Even the fact that Gentiles and Jews would be joined together came out of the Old Testament. Uh, he says in Acts chapter 26, verse 17 through 23, that his gospel came out of the Old Testament. Peter said in 1 Peter 1, 9 through 12, that his gospel came out of the Old Testament. They're preaching the same thing because they got it from the same source. Jesus came and proving the gospel and his death, burial, and resurrection came out of the Old Testament. He goes back and quotes the Old Testament. Paul writes 14 letters in the New Testament. 14 of 27 of the New Testament books. That's over half of the New Testament that Paul gives us. And Paul was given great light uh, about things. And I mean, he brought home this thing about Jew and Gentile in one body. I mean, he brought that thing home. And he probably taught Peter some things about that as well. But they were not preaching two different Gospels in two different churches, in two different dispensations. Now, notice in Acts chapter 15, and I'm going to be reading uh, from verse uh, 6 uh, in this uh, chapter. And by the way, how many times have you ever heard that before the cross, the gospel was never mentioned, never talked about? Have you ever read Acts 20, verse 28, where Jesus talked about uh, redeeming uh, mankind? What about John 3.16, John 3.36, John 3.15, John chapter 5? Uh, John 14.6, these are all words that are given to it. John 14.6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. I mean, Jesus spoke of His death. They didn't totally comprehend it. and and But Jesus spoke of His death, burial, and resurrection several times throughout His earthly ministry. And in John 3.16 and John 3.36, it's faith. It's faith. It's faith in the Lord Jesus. It's believing that He is the Messiah and the Savior. Well, notice in Acts 15, this is the first church council, Jerusalem council. I'm reading from verse 6, and please, please hang on uh, to the words as, as we read down through here. Notice carefully verse 6. He says in verse 6, And the apostles and elders came together for to consider this matter. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles, what's the next few words? By my mouth. By my mouth. Not by Peter, not by Paul's. Peter. Peter was the first that was sent to a Gentile. And he said, By my mouth should, the, sh should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God which knoweth the hearts bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost even as He did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Is that, is that clear enough? And it's going to get clearer as we read on. But I, what I want you to see in this passage, Peter said that the Jew and Gentiles are saved the same way. And then Paul stands up in verse 12 and said, that's right. And then James stands up uh, in, in another verse here, uh, verse 13, he said, that's right. Notice in verse uh, 10. Now therefore, it's why I tempt you. See, they were, they were false brethren come in saying, no, the Gentiles can't be saved unless they're circumcised. And that's what this meeting is all about. And then he says in verse 10, Now therefore why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. Keep in mind, Peter's still speaking. And he said in verse 11, But we believe that through the grace... Oh, I thought that was what Paul preached. We believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Gentiles saved like the Jews. The Jews saved like the Gentiles. Well, how are the Jews saved? By faith in Jesus Christ. Repentance and faith. How are the Gentiles saved? By repentance and faith. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more tonight. Now, notice with me, verse 7, Peter said, By my mouth they heard the gospel and believed. And then in verse uh, uh, 10, again, we find that Peter was the first apostle 
to go to the Gentiles, he preached Christ crucified. Very clear and very plain. And then in verse 12, it says, Then all the multitude kept silent and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracle, miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. And then James stands up, and James says in verse uh, 14, says, Simon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. Each writer had their own style of writing, but each writer is writing about the same gospel and the same church, and they're writing about the same principles. Now, let's move away from the gospel. I, I could have... I could have spent two months on this, but I just don't want to do it. Turn with me to um, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And let's move to water baptism. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And I want to read verse 14 through verse 17 to begin with. Should water baptism be practiced today? Should it be practiced today? And again... You'd say, well, that's a no-brainer. We, we know that. We grew up, you know, believing that. But here's one of the key verses that is used in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and also they'll quote Ephesians 4 verse 4. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, which is a spiritual baptism. And they say, well, in the dispensation of grace, there's only one, and it's a spiritual, so there's no need for physical water baptism. And many of the dispensationalists, hyper-dispensationalists, will tell you that in Acts 2.38, that Peter is preaching a faith and works-based salvation when he said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. They'll say that Peter is preaching that baptism is absolutely necessary for salvation or for the new birth. But Paul did not preach that. Well, here is, here is the key verses, the proof text that they use for not baptizing converts. I know this. I was in the system for a number of years. Now keep in mind, 1 Corinthians is written about 57 A.D. Paul is saved about 35 A.D. And his letter is written about 57 A.D. A good 20 plus years. Now watch what he says in verse 14. He says, I thank God that I baptize none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name, and I baptize also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptize any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of wisdom, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. This is a proof text for no Water baptism during the dispensation of grace. The context shows us that there was much carnality and divisions in the church at Corinth. Now, it was a church, it was God's church, and God dealt with it. But still yet, as Paul writes his letters, there was much carnality. Let me give you an example. They had become... Followers of men. Each one of them had their favorite minister. And you read about this again in chapter 3, verses 1 through 9 and verse 22. Notice in verse 10, notice the context. He said in verse 10, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our, our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. What have been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are the household of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now here's what they're saying. 
Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, I am of Paulus, I am of Cephas, I am Christ. See, they knew Cephas. They knew his teachings. But they became followers of men. And the statement that Paul is making here is not preceded or followed by a confession of Paul's misbehavior. Paul is not making any mistakes here. He's exhorting the Corinthians on the importance of the gospel of Christ, the cross of Christ. And in other words, he's placing the importance on that and not emphasizing the water baptism. The water baptism is important, but it doesn't save. Only the cross and the gospel save. Notice he said in verse 13, Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? In other words, it, the indications is that all the Corinthians were baptized, but not by Paul or in Paul's name. So now, as we come to verse 14 and 15, I want you to notice that Paul thanked God with this church at Corinth now. He thanked God that he baptized so few, not because it was wrong. He wouldn't have done it if it had been wrong. But he's thanking God he baptized so few of them, lest any should say that he baptized in his own name. He wasn't even the pastor there. He traveled and preached. And so he was very careful with this particular church because of the followers of men in this church. And it's taken up again in chapter 3 and verse 1. He calls them carnal because of this. Now, notice with me as we read verse 6, 15 and 16. Well, verse 14. Let's go back to verse 14 and watch this. He said, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. So he did baptize. And it wasn't wrong to do it. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. Knows he wasn't keeping record. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. The statement in verse 17 is not made because he did not baptize, or that it was wrong to baptize, but the statement in verse 17 is made because baptism has nothing to do with the gospel of salvation or the salvation of the soul. We baptize as a testimony to one's salvation. We bring people in the church as members. as a, and That's commanded, but it's not how you get saved. Now notice a couple of things quickly. Turn with me to Acts 16. I've got to do this quickly. Acts 16. Time is slipping away. Notice in Acts 16. Now let's, let's talk about Paul baptizing. Okay? Let's go to Acts 16 with Lydia in verse 14 and 15. Now keep in mind, Paul was saved around A.D. 33. Acts chapter 16 is, a, is around A.D. 53. Almost 20 years. Okay? If Let's say that we give Paul, he could make a mistake once or twice with baptism, but you're telling me 20 years, Paul, you're still baptizing? Paul was baptized himself in Acts 9. And 20 years later, you're baptizing Lydia, you're baptizing the Philippian jailer in his household, you're baptizing the Corinthians in chapter 18, you're baptizing uh, John's disciples in chapter 19 and verse 6. Watch this. In verse... In Acts chapter 16, 14, and 15. And a certain woman named Lydia, seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, and, and heard us, whose heart the Lord opened. Now watch this. And she attended unto the things which are spoken by who? Paul. Okay. Not Peter. Paul. It says in verse 15, And when she was baptized. Notice that. When she was baptized and her household. She besought us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide here. And she constrained us. She listened to Paul and believed the gospel and followed that in water baptism. Notice the Philippian jailer in Acts 16. I'm reading now from verse 30. 
and, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? I'm not reading the whole text. You know what's in the text. Verse 31. And they said, this is Paul and Silas, and they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that went that were in his house. Verse 33, And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his, straightway. The Philippian jailer and all in his house believed and were baptized. Lydia and all of her house believed and were baptized. Notice now, let's go to the Corinthian church. Acts 18 is where the Corinthian church was started. We're talking about A.D. 55. Roughly around there. 20 years after Paul was converted. Even more years than that after Pentecost. Now notice uh, we're coming to Acts chapter 18, verse 7 and 8. And you can write down Acts 19, verse 1 through 6, where Paul baptized John's disciples. Now think about this. Twenty years after Paul's conversion, he's still baptizing. While he's writing his epistles in the book of Acts, he's still baptizing. Half of Paul's epistles were written during the book of Acts, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, um, help me out, uh, Thessalonians. Those are Acts epistles. The other epistles are prison epistles and written later. And so he's baptizing while he's writing these letters. Acts 18, verse 6 and 7. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his, shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean from henceforth I go unto the Gentiles. So he's speaking of the Jews in the synagogue, and this is what he's matter. He'd go in the synagogue and preach, and then go out. And verse 7 and 8, And he departed thence, and entered into a certain man's house, named Justice, one that feared, one that worshipped God, rather, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. While Paul was here and establishing this church, we find that he baptized some of them, but not all of them. So clearly, water baptism is not a kingdom gospel issue in just the four gospels or in Hebrews to Revelation. We find that the Water baptism, and I don't have to convince you of this, but for the sake of those that would listen to the sermon, water baptism was practiced by the Apostle Paul, we know positively, 20 years after his conversion. For sure, 20 years after his conversion. All right, let's go to our third point and last point, And I'm going to ask you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians chapter 1. Notice here in Ephesians 1. Now I'm going to begin reading in verse 20. And let's talk about the church. They say that the church, which is his body, in Paul's epistles is not the same church in the four Gospels at Pentecost and in Hebrews through the book of Revelation. They talk about a kingdom church and a grace church, a bride and a body, Israel and the church, here in the New Testament. Now that's confusing because you've got thousands of New Testament saints that were saved at Pentecost and later, and they're in one church, and then you've got Paul preaching, the Jew and Gentiles, and they're in another church living in the same towns in the same century, interacting with one another. Peter, sometime, Peter would have to leave his church. and I mean, it's confusing. It's confusing. But again, why do people come to these conclusions? Because they can't answer everything. They look at difficult passages or obscure passages and say, this don't make any sense. And so, well, 
let's get an axe and start chopping this thing up. And they say, well, this is for the Jew, this is for me, this over here is for the Jew, for the tribulation and the kingdom, and they get all this stuff divided up. And you know what they do? They rob themselves of many blessings from the Old Testament, from the Sermon on the Mount. Do you know that Paul and Peter and James and John repeat nearly everything that Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount? Paul repeats some of that himself. And you know, to me, the greatest book in the Bible for comfort, and some of you probably disagree with this, the greatest book in the Bible for comfort is the book of Revelation. Now people tell me that book scares me to death. I find more comfort in Revelation. Every funeral I preach is, I start it in Revelation 14. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. It's a, so think about if you're an extreme hyper dispensationalist or an ultra dispensationalist that you could call them, you've robbed yourself. Remember when we went through the book of Hebrews, the blessings we got out of that? Remember when we went through first and going now through second Peter? What about through first, second, third John, the book of Jude? You rob yourself of tremendous blessings. And what you do, you say, that's not for me. That's for them in the future. I can read it, but it has nothing to do. So there's no spiritual uh, truth that comes out of that for your soul. In Ephesians 1, I'm going to begin reading in verse 20. And keep in mind, Jesus said in Matthew 16, verse 18 and 19, He said, Upon this rock... I shall build, what's the next two words? My church. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell. My church, he says, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Well, I want to be in his church. I want to, and I believe that Paul was in his church and Peter was in his church. I want to be in his church. And the first mention of church in New Testament is in Matthew 16:18. The word church is used 115 times. Now watch this. When did this church begin? Verse 20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principalities and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And had put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of Him that filleth all things. Well, He raised Him up in verse 20 and set Him at His own right hand. And He put all things in verse 22 under His feet and made Him to be head over all things of the church, which is His body. When did Christ take possession of this and sit down on the right hand of the Father upon His throne that was at His ascension that's recorded in Acts chapter one, after his resurrection, his ascension, and so that's what the apostle Paul is talking about. So Christ was head of his church a number of years before Paul was ever saved, and not only that. You see, notice with me, and by the way, he's a, it's actually called his body in verse twenty-three. So the body of Christ existed before Paul was ever born again. And this is one body. Notice in Ephesians 2 and verse 13, But now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For He is our peace, who hath made both one, broken down the middle wall of petition between us, having abolished in His flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinance, for to make in Himself notice of twain one new man. That happened at the cross. Began to be preached at Pentecost. He said in verse 16 that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Verse 19, Now therefore ye, Gentiles, are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation, notice, of the apostles and prophets, plural, not just Paul, but built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus which is predominantly Gentiles 
And he's saying, you've been now included in this. He really spends a lot of time because God said, I'm going to send you to the Gentiles. And he spends a lot of time showing that the Gentiles and Jews are one body through the cross that began to be preached at Pentecost. And again in chapter 3, he mentions the mystery of Christ, verse 5, which was not known, which in other ages was not known in the sons of men as it is now revealed. Notice unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ for the gospel. The point in all of this is that the mystery revealed under the holy apostles and prophets that Paul was given was that Jew and Gentile are in one body. Ephesians 4 verse 4 says there's one body. And it speaks of the church. 1 Corinthians 12 13, there's one body that we're baptized into. Colossians 2 24, there is one body. Now go back to Galatians 1 and notice in Galatians 1, and he says here in Galatians 1 13, he said, For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. This church is in Acts 247, 511, 81, 8, 3, 11, 22, 26, 12, 1, and 12, 5, and 13, 1, and 14, 23, and 15, 3, and chapter 20, verse 28. Same church. It's the church of God. It's called a church of God in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28 in 1 Corinthians 15, 9. 1 Corinthians 10.30 and 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Same church. Paul said, I persecuted the church of God. Notice now as we come down to verse 22, I told you we'll come back to this. Verse 22 and 23, and he says, And was unknown by faith unto the churches of Judea, which were in Christ, but they had heard only that he which persecuted us in time past now preached the faith which he wants to strive. So he's talking about the church of God. He Verse 1 mentions, verse 2, I'm sorry, verse 2 mentions churches. Verse 13, the church of God. And verse 22, the churches of Judea. These churches were in Christ. Those were in Christ. Notice that they were in Christ before Paul was ever saved. He persecuted the church and those that were in Christ when he was an unbeliever. Notice Romans 16. Romans chapter 16, notice with me in verse 7. Romans 16 and verse 7. So to be in Christ is to be in the church. Paul persecuted the church of God, those which were in Christ. He wasted it. This is before his conversion and now he's a member of it. He's preaching the faith that he wants destroyed. So to be in Christ is to be in the church. To be in the church is to be in Christ. He even told the disciples in John 14, 20, that he would be in them and they in him. Well, notice with me now as we come here to Romans chapter 16 and verse 7. And I got, I got to squeeze in one more verse after this. We're running out of time. Notice in verse, chapter 16 and verse 7, he says, Salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles, notice that, who also were in Christ before me. They were people that were in Christ before Paul. How did they get in Christ? By the gospel. Through the faith. So they were those that were saved and in the church before Paul was ever saved and placed in Christ and placed in the church. One last verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm running this down to the minute. 80 minute sermon. Notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I got a lot more out of say and we'll say it later. But notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Keep in mind, there is one olive tree. Romans 11, verse 20 through 24. There's one olive tree. Unbeliever, believing Jews were broken out of it. Believing Gentiles were grafted into it. There's one church. One church. Not two, not three. There is one church. Notice with me in 1 Corinthians 11, reading in verse 1. He said, Be followers of me 
even as I also am of Christ. Now, why do I close with this passage and skipping about 20 others? I close with this passage because he said, Be ye followers of me, even as I am of Christ. The Apostle Paul followed Christ. And to follow Paul today is to follow the teachings of Christ. Because Paul taught what Jesus Christ gave unto him and gave unto the other apostles, Peter, James, and John. This is exactly what he taught. And again, if we chop our Bible to pieces, we rob ourselves of precious truth and it leads us into heresies. Would you stand with me this morning? Father, we thank Thee for this day, the time You've given us together, Your love and mercy to us. And Lord, I pray that this will be a help to someone. Lord, and even given my own testimony, my own background, and dear God, help us to believe all Scripture. And help us to love all Scripture equally. The Lord, help us to realize there is one gospel here in the New Testament. There is one church here in the New Testament and is the church of the living God and the gospel of Jesus Christ by which we're saved. Lord, we ask all of these things in Christ's name. Amen and amen.